fewer young people are getting married today. For good or ill, the idea of the American family has undergone a radical transformation in the past few decades. Our subject today, the modern American family, and this is the business of life. Michael Moynihan, and welcome to the business of life. So what constitutes a family has changed dramatically in the last few decades. Fewer Americans are getting married, rates of cohabitation have increased, women are having fewer children, gay marriage exists. So how has the restructured American family changed us? And how much is it costing us? As always, we'll break down the issue using facts, figures, dollars, and cents. And I'm joined tonight by a panel of experts uniquely qualified to answer the question, what is the modern American family? So let's meet our panelists. Ty Tashiro is the author of The Science of Happily Ever After, a book that will uh, tell us how to use data and social science to help people choose the perfect partner. That's true? That's okay. right. Great. And Mona Chalabi writes uh, about how data affects who we are and what we do at 538.com, part of the ESPN media empire. And Maureen O'Connor, a columnist at New York Magazine who writes about sex, love, and relationships, and according to Complex.com, is the 26th most eligible bachelorette in New York City. <laughs> that was 2012. No, no longer. longer? It's really? dropping. Oh, it's dropping. It's just the, the numbers are dropping. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's begin with our first topic, the changing American family. You know, let's bring up our, our first stat here. 900 percent, that's the increase in cohabitation by non-married couples over the past 50 years. Mona, this is a bit uh, alarming. It doesn't surprise anybody that I tell this to, but it's, but it's a huge number. But the US population has also increased, right? So yeah. the number of cohabiting couples has also increased yeah. because the US population has increased. There's still, there's still a huge increase, yeah, right? absolutely. What does this say about the sort of drift of American culture and love and all of these things? I mean, you know, 1950, this number is tiny, the number of people that are cohabitating. Currently, right now, 3% of US adults are cohabiting. So it is still a massive change in American culture, but whether it's a, a good or a bad one. But on top of that, there are just more single Americans than ever before. About half of American adults are single now, which is the highest rate through history. I believe it's only two of 10 millennials are married right now, compared to, say, Generation X, when they were our age, there was three in 10 were married. Ty, you're a sort of money ball nerd of relationships, right? That, that's right, that's right. Why is this happening? This is unique in human history. Sure, isn't it? Hey, sometimes it's economic. Uh, it's cheaper to have a roommate, and why not just shack up with the person that you're dating. It's also the case that religion plays less of a role now in governing how we do our relationships. And so that prohibition has fallen away for a lot of Americans. Hi guys. Do you think that we are focusing too much on a fairy tale of what a wedding is? And we kind of don't focus enough on if someone is ready to get married. I did a fair amount of research on this idea of the fairy tale relationship. And it, it actually goes back to the Romantic era in the mid 1800s. And so before that, marriage was just this very pragmatic thing. Like, you, you just did it for economic reasons or for social capital. And then you, people started marrying for love, and that was actually a really weird thing to do. The other thing to keep in mind is that at that time, life expectancy was only around 40 years old, 42 years old. So the happily ever after idea comes up at that time. Now we live, you know, almost twice as long. So ever after is a heck of a lot longer now. Before you could just be like, well, you know, We'll call it quits after 20 years, just because that'll be, <laughs> that'll be that. Let's bring up this next number. I think this is interesting. Only one in three young people today believe that marriage is important for the, a lifelong relationship. This is not a necessary thing to keep uh, a relationship together. Maureen, is that true, that it's not? I mean, I'm kind of shocked. Even one in three think that. Yeah, me too, it's, actually. <laughs> it's, I think it's the, the key is that the way we think of what constitutes adulthood, the sort of hallmarks of when somebody becomes an adult, and when they build a family have shifted a little. So millennials are more likely to say that parenthood is one of the most important things in a lifetime, as opposed to, say, marriage. So we still do care about, say, the family unit, but it's whether we're defining it by the moment that two people, you know, solidify their union in a marriage, whether that itself is what's so important. But here's a strange thing. We are an incredibly religious country. 
I mean, top of the tables for everybody, number of people who believe in God, 89%, something right. like that. How come that doesn't correlate? Because it's that age group. So see that little asterisk there that says 18 to 29? They're the group that are the most likely to be atheists. Well, you know, I'm going to throw another number up here. $17,400. That's the median income for never married mothers. So if we get married, this, everyone gets rich, right? Well, that's, isn't, that's, that, isn't that what happens? That's part of the idea. So there's been a lot of policy, actually, at the national level to try to encourage people to marry. And it's a little bit of correlation causation problem because the assumption is, is that marriage causes things like graduation rates or causes things like uh, better mental health. But in fact, that's not, that's not really the case. And even that goes with wealth. So people who are below the poverty line when they marry, that doesn't really improve their circumstance long term because divorce costs a lot of money too. How does a singlehood sort of affect the economy. You know, in the 1950s, advertisers were going after, this is the Chrysler car for the family, this is the Disney family vacation. So how does it affect the, the economy? Are people are working longer, maybe going after careers more than they would when they were going for more blue collar jobs? What are the statistics that you guys know of of these things? Certainly corporations sort of respond to people being single and respond to the way it is. But in so many ways, I think staying single and living single is actually the ultimate luxury good. When you consider that a woman couldn't actually support herself staying single until recent decades in America, that in order to just be stable and to have, to be able to afford to live in a home with somebody, a woman would have to tie herself to a man. So the idea that now anybody can sort of choose to live by themselves in an apartment all on their own, they can support themselves, they can have you know, a social life on their own. In some ways, I think that that's almost this ultimate incredible luxury to be able to choose that and have that not be a punishment for you where you're alone and the only person that loves you is a cat. In fact, you chose to be there and you love your cat. Like, <laughs> you're having a good time. Awesome. This is sort of interesting too. 57% of births to young people happen out of wedlock. In 1950, that number was 4% incredible rise in, in numbers from 4%. It's having an effect. Well, there's an effect. So if, if a kid is raised in a single parent home, they don't fare as well as when they're in a home with two parents. But the caveat there is two parents who get along with each other. So if it's conflictual parents and they divorce, then the kids do better in those circumstances. So marriage is correlated with a lot of good outcomes, but there's a lot of marriages that aren't happy. And when that's the case, that's actually the worst possible case scenario. I, let's bring up another number here. $245,000. That's the estimated total cost of raising a child born in 2013 for middle income parents. It, it is very expensive and you don't have to have kids anymore. Yeah. It used to be the case for most of the history of marriage that you had to have kids to work on a farm or to help out at the shop or whatever else it oh, was. Oh, I was wondering if there was some sort of law that I missed that you had, <laughs> yeah. no, you, know, you had to have kids. People can think, hey, we can be perfectly happy. And there's such a value now on the, on the happiness of a marriage and having this kind of hedonic lifestyle where things are just great and you get to travel and everything else. And kids obviously make that more difficult to do. Is it, I mean, is that one of the things that we don't, we don't want to grow up? Like, I mean, kids means you have to grow up, right? You can't just, you know, go out anytime you want. So, I mean, I see somebody who has a, a kid when they're 19 years old, and I think it's strange. Like, that was pretty common, like, you know, 40 or 50 years ago, right? I think that we're also at a moment when people are really thinking seriously about not just defaulting to having children or defaulting to marriage in the way that I think was different in different generations. So people really say, well, do we actually want to be married? Do we actually want to just be together and be unmarried together? Do we want to have a child or do I choose just to be in this relationship and a marriage that will never have a child? And I think um, overall, I think that's probably a positive thing that people aren't just sort of defaulting to, I guess I have to have a kid and now we're trapped in this loveless marriage with a child and every, you know. It sounds so horrible. It does sound horrible. <laughs> Really? And I, think I mean, it's... sometimes people like have, they have a kid and they love the kid, right? <laughs> yes, and I mean, of course. Right? It happens in any, any number of ways. But I think we're taking seriously the idea that, say, a woman can be unmarried and childless, and that can be her, the way she chooses to lead her life. And the same thing for a man. And that sort of anybody can make that choice based on their finances, based on their life goals, based on what they think makes them happy. I think 50 years ago, if you were married and didn't have kids, people would just assume that something wasn't working. Like, like physically wasn't in the working. trousers, or yeah. Just, <laughs> in, in the trousers. Yeah. Uh, for the Americans, you know, that's the pants. Oh, sorry. That's where that's where the things <laughs> exist. No, I mean, is that, I mean, is that the case now? What is the reason that when you look at these numbers of people having having children at such a young age, they tend to be in lower income brackets? One of the ideas that's tossed around is modeling. So um, you see this transmission between generations, where that's the way my folks did it. So I'll do it that way too. 
Um, but it leaves a lot, of, uh, a lot to be desired as far as an explanation. Yeah. There is actually a little bit of data on it. So the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention, actually, um, each time that a child is born, they do this massive, massive survey, and they ask, um, was the child unplanned and wanted, unplanned and unwanted, or planned altogether? And you see that for a lot of younger age groups, the children were unplanned. But they, a lot of them are nevertheless wanted, but they were unplanned pregnancies. Hi. Um, do you think the recession has made people less likely to get married? It has, in, in fact. So um, it, was, it was actually, you saw a decline in marital rates uh, when we went into the recession. Actually, if you go back to history, when there are recessions, people are less likely to marry. Um, there's some studies that suggest it's driven by um, the idea that men still propose a lot of the times in heterosexual marriages. And if men are unemployed or a low level of income, they're less likely to propose in those situations. So we have some remnants of this kind of old way, old school way, of proposing, and, that, and that's what gets in the way with these uh, economic circumstances. So with all the changes in how the American family is coming together, are people actually having more or less babies than they did in the past? Um, the drop in marriage has also seen um, the sort of concurrent rise in children being born out of wedlock. So it isn't necessarily that, you know, millennials aren't marrying and that means they're never ever going to have kids, because actually, in fact, they do value parenthood still and do plan, I think it's about 70% of millennials do think they want to have children someday, even if they haven't yet. Do you think that maybe in a man's mentality that I'm going to have to have sex with this one person for the rest of my life, maybe that might have a kind of a negative impact on wanting to be married? I don't know why that would necessarily be only for men versus women too. Women too. Sex is so important for marital satisfaction and stability. I mean, like my old advisor in graduate school used to say, you can play tennis with anybody you want, but you can only have sex with one person, so it, it better be good, right? right. And uh, people are, are waiting until they find someone they actually enjoy having sex with. And that can, that can take a while for some people, probably. So. Let's move on now to, to our second topic and get you know, a little more specific with marriage and divorce. Um, put up a number here that 28858 is the average cost of a wedding in the United States, and that does not include the honeymoon. This is crazy. People spend an insane amount of money. Right. It's crazy. I know. It's about the same as a year of tuition at um, a private university in America right now to, in order to get married. Um, there's, on one hand, it's crazy that our, our sort of obsession with the institution of marriage is really ambivalent. Because on one hand, we don't think marriage is necessary in order to have a good sort of relationship. On the other hand, we care a lot about marriage because we're fighting about who's allowed to get married, and people care a lot about their weddings. Um, I have this friend who has this theory, she was saying, well, you know, back in old times, it was really traumatic when a bride got married that she would have sex for the first time in her life. She would move out of her parents' house for the first time in her life. Now we just traumatize these women by forcing them to get calligraphy and forcing them to plan a wedding and forcing them to go through, you know, $30,000 worth of stress, basically. Um, the, the, the data on this stuff, I mean, you're looking about what, your book about what makes people happy. What, is this, is this necessary? Yeah, I, I don't think so. There's that study that came out recently about the more people you had at your wedding, the less likely it was you're going to divorce, for example. And so oh, we're going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, Just wait. You would, you know, you'd sort of spend more money, I guess, if you had more guests. But uh, no, you know, things like that. That's usually a third variable thing where it's you probably have more friends or you have more social support. So it's the things that we think that matter actually do matter. Uh, for tax reasons, is it? Smarter for me to get married to my partner, or is it actually, should we stay single and file separately? Do not marry for tax reasons. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I disagree, marry for tax reasons. <laughs> I mean, the, the marriage for tax reasons would, would be a good short-term benefit, but the average divorce costs about $100,000 in legal fees. So you have to weigh that. Uh, how long would you be married at what rate of discount? Uh, you know, weighed against the amount of legal fees you have when you divorce. So if it would be a great marriage and you think it's going to last, then that could be a good fringe benefit. Let's put this up that uh, complicates matters a little bit. Uh, couples who elope are 12.5 times more likely to get a divorce than couples who have more than 200 guests at their wedding. I, so I have to have a lot of friends if I want to have a successful marriage. Is that worth finding? What is, what is this telling us? I think there's an element of social shame here, right? If you're going to stand up and get married in front of 200 people, it's slightly more embarrassing to then turn around, you know, a month or two months later. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but there's certainly an element of social shame there. But the thing that I'm really curious about is what's the definition of elope here, right? Like, 
Is this actually people kind of stealing off in the middle of the night and never telling anyone, or is this just getting married abroad? Because they're two totally different things. Right? Yeah, I think it would probably be, we could ask the good people at Emory University who produced this study, but I think it would be not telling anyone, mm. not telling your parents, coming back with some sort of, you know, scraggy looking dirt bag and saying, that's my partner. Right. That's what I, that's what I think, it's not a scientific, but I think that's what they do. Well, I mean, the point of the wedding is sort of that you're standing up in front of everybody and making a promise, right? And it's not just that you're promising the person you are speaking to, because he already knows that you're going to be together. You already made that decision on your own. Rather, it's that you're promising it to everybody around you, that we're now going to operate as a social unit together. And I suppose that that's the element that gives you the social shame factor, that you're too embarrassed to sort of separate yourself from <laughs> yeah. them, that you've made this commitment in front of everyone, and you just invested, you know, $28,000, so... To, to tell your friends that you're never going to see them again. Can't get divorced yet. I grew up in a divorced household between two houses in a relatively unique family situation, so I'm wondering, is the increase in the divorce rate because there's less of a social stigma from divorce because I've had relationships with other people where the family was together and it was a much more broken household than my divorced household that I grew up with? It's a great question, and there's these comparison studies between divorced homes and, and couples that are married, and uh, your, your intuition about that's very right. And, and there's some couples that are together and they're very unhappy, and that's actually the worst possible case scenario. Um, but sometimes we oversimplify that, I think, uh, either just in our own minds or at the policy level that marriage is actually the way to go. And it's, it's gotta be a good marriage, and that's, that's hard to find these days. It's not that it can't happen, but People have to really work hard at it and be very thoughtful about it. Let's, let's take a look at another number here where we look at education. There's been a 43% increase in income for couples who have both have postgraduate degrees. And the sort of smaller number here is for couples with only high school diplomas, there's been a 20% decrease in income. It, education in time is basically the, the key to a successful uh, marriage. I think the idea that a successful marriage is one that always lasts isn't always the case anymore. And I think that when people are saying more and more that marriage isn't their ultimate goal in life, it's because of the marriage itself and whether a marriage is necessary for a lifelong relationship isn't how we define what's valuable in a relationship anymore. And I think that especially, you know, a younger generation that has sort of come up as children of a divorce, we can recognize that a relationship can be valuable and a marriage can be valuable, not necessarily because it lasts until one person died, but because this is this is sort of its own relationship and its own thing. Is it more likely now, though, because the stigma of divorce has been removed a bit, that there, there is actually sort of more to be gleaned from people who stay together, whereas, you know, 100 years ago, divorce was a really shameful thing, and you couldn't really tell if a long marriage actually meant happiness. If it was a happy one, sure. And I mean, some of it just might be just sort of our sort of rose-colored glasses that after divorce, you have to look back and find some way to say, well, we did get something great out of it. We had these wonderful children, or, you know, we had all those wonderful years together. But yeah, it's also true that I think there are probably no one ever a says lot that. of people. <laughs> I've never seen anyone say that. Like, I was, this was so wonderful. Just time to end um, it at this point. Well, your kids will at least think your marriage is worth something because they came out of it. But there, there, it is true that I think there are probably Maybe. plenty of people in horribly miserable marriages for a long time that we just didn't see it publicly because we didn't see them divorcing and we didn't see them restarting their lives. When in fact, they're probably having crises behind closed doors too. Yeah. Hi. Are we finding that people with lower education get married more often? And so maybe it's a higher likelihood that they'll get a divorce because it's so many of them? Marriage rates are higher for people that are less educated. But hopefully, I haven't seen the way that the research has put this together, but hopefully those percentages are based on of people that were married, what's the likelihood that they're going to get divorced? So hopefully the fact that there are more people that are getting married shouldn't affect that. I might say too, just that there's, there's starting to be a little bit of a marriageability problem among heterosexual couples where women are really ascending in so many ways, uh, educationally, economically, and even emotional intelligence, uh, all these different ways that they're moving divergent from men. Men are kind of going the opposite direction. So what you're seeing sometimes is that, you know, the, the woman's intelligent and she's confident and she's just got everything going for her. There's not the a pool of men to, to draw from if it's, if it's a heterosexual kind of relationship. So. And we don't have to anymore, right? It's, it goes back to what we were saying about financial independence. I don't have to marry someone that I don't want to marry. The confidence of being single that you spoke of earlier, does, that kind of plays a part into it too for both genders where it's like, I'm okay. You know, where at one point if a man was single at a certain point, it's kind of like, 
What's wrong with you? I say know? though, I don't think things are like perfectly equalised. So I think like you can be 35 and be a man and be a bachelor and not have any raised eyebrows. If you hit 35 as a woman, there's still some like, uh, that's true. Because it still comes down to the body clock thing, right? It's like, yeah. do you want to have kids? That's if you're 35, time is running out for you as a woman, but that sperm is still good, which by the way, is not actually true. Men's sperm gets old and it gets <laughs> 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 an attack. <laughs> Good call. I know that. <laughs> well, we learned that relationships are depressing, expensive, and incredibly difficult. And for that, I'd like to thank our panelists, Ty, Mona, Maureen. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at bettermoneyhabits.com.